Nice to meet you. The woman who entered the room suddenly greeted me. If I marry this woman, my father's debts will be wiped out, I thought. However, she had a scar on her face, and more importantly, there was my father to consider. Are you really okay with this? When I asked, she fell silent for a while. My name is Chris Baker, 45 years old. I was an only child raised by my father who ran a small town factory and my timid mother. My dad had a strong streak of independence from a young age and started a metalworking factory in his mid-twenties. However, the business never did well, and my parents quarreled almost every night. By the time I entered junior high, I realized their business was on the brink of collapse. It was clear that it would be better to give up. Still, my dad never lost hope and always smiled in front of me. I lived a poor life because of my dad, but seeing him work, I couldn't truly resent him. Eventually, I started helping out in the factory. It turned out that I really was my dad's son. I had a natural talent for precision work. I wanted to work in the same field, but who knew how long the factory would last? With those mixed feelings, I studied at a technical high school and helped at the factory when I got home. I led a life far removed from club activities or romance. In my senior year of high school, I planned to take over my dad's factory. However, my dad strongly opposed this and said, it's not that easy. He also insisted, at least get some experience at other companies first. I thought it would be the same since it was the same industry, but he wouldn't budge no matter how much I tried to persuade him. While I thought it was my lack of ability back then, maybe he just didn't want me to go through the same struggles. After a fight with my dad, I left home. I got a job at a steel plant in a neighboring state, working hard every day. My dad's unique way of doing things had rubbed off on me and I often got scolded by my experienced colleagues. Meanwhile, my dad kept running his business on the edge. He never gave up his old-fashioned quality over quantity mindset and ran the business without thinking about profit. There was even talk of a merger once because of his skills, but he turned that down, saying it would lower the quality. I was so exasperated by his stubbornness that I couldn't say anything. Even so, I had no time to worry about my family. Work consumed me daily and romance or marriage were far from my mind. My twenties and thirties flew by, and I suddenly found myself in my forties. Just when I thought I had finally become a full-fledged adult, my parents started to weaken. My dad suddenly collapsed one hot August and passed away in the hospital the following winter. A strain from his hard work must have caught up with him. If he had been checked earlier, there might have been a chance for recovery. My mom blamed herself for not forcing him to go to the hospital. But even if she did, he probably wouldn't have gone no matter what. It was such a sudden farewell that I couldn't even cry. Nevertheless, when I saw the rusty factory at home for the first time in decades, I couldn't stop crying. I would never see my dad standing there again. In the end, I had always been watching his back. I finally realized that after turning 40. Anyway, the factory had to be closed. I wanted to take over and rebuild it but it wasn't realistic. Just when I decided to carry on my dad's spirit in my own way and move forward out of nowhere, my life took an unexpected turn. It all started with my dad's debt. We discovered that he had racked up several thousand dollars of debt, which even my mom didn't realize. The money was borrowed from a factory owner he had known for years, Mr. Adams. Mr. Adams used to play with me a few times when I was a kid, he and my dad frequently visited each other's factories and had quite a close relationship. Mr. Adams switched to mass production early on and quickly flourished. Now, his factory is one of the most prominent in town. About a month after my dad's funeral, Mr. Adams called me over. It was surely about the debt. I thought if I paid it back little by little, I might be able to clear it while I'm still alive. Although I didn't know how to apologize, I headed to see him. However, what I heard there was shocking. We'll take over your father's factory and clear the debt, Mr. Adams declared. I thought it was a joke, but he continued, in return, I'd like you to marry my daughter. I thought I was dreaming, but he was dead serious. Mr. Adams has only one daughter. She was 32 and single at the time, working in his company's office. She had never been married and had no children. He simply said, I want her to settle down soon. If I marry her, the debt will be gone. Besides, though our factory will be absorbed, the machinery and skittles will be preserved. However, if I refuse the marriage, it all goes away. I was bewildered and bombarded him with questions. Well, I don't have much experience with relationships, I stammered. 
I blurted it out before I could even feel embarrassed. Neither does my daughter. Just meet her once, he calmly said. That night, I was invited to Mr. Adams' house, waiting in a room for his daughter to arrive. When the door opened, I gasped. She had a large burn scar on her face, with the skin color differing on each side, making it clear that something had happened. I understood why Mr. Adams wanted me to marry her to clear the debt. It was probably hard for her to find marriage prospects because of the scar. What hurt me the most was that she accepted such a terrible arrangement. My name is Lisa Adams. Nice to meet you. Lisa greeted me politely. She didn't seem to have any intention of opposing her father's wishes. When I couldn't say anything out of confusion, she said, I've heard the situation from my father. If you're okay with it, I don't mind. She spoke matter-of-factly. She got the scar as a child when she snuck into the factory to play and got burned. From my perspective, the arrangement seemed beneficial. The debt would be cleared, the factory would remain, and I would get married. However, there was no benefit for Lisa. We stared at each other in silence for a while. All I could think about was my dad, who had left me with an impossible situation. Even if I wanted to hate him, I couldn't. Maybe that was the only thing Lisa and I had in common. Are you really okay with this? I asked, looking into her eyes. The silence continued and soon tears welled up in her eyes. Eventually, she started crying like a child and murmured, I can't accept this. She had been just forcing herself to accept it. Then let's call this off, I suggested. I can handle the debt and the factory on my own. I can't drag her into this, I said to myself. However, Lisa stopped me, wiping her tears. No, I have to do something, she insisted, showing concern for me. I thought harder than I ever had in my life and then came to a conclusion. Lisa, I have an idea if it's okay with you. I shared my idea with her, and she nodded slightly. I told Mr. Adams, I would like to marry your daughter, but could we have a bit of a courtship period? You know, we've only just met. That was my answer, and he accepted. I quit my previous job at the steel plant and joined Mr. Adams' company. I also moved into his house as Lisa's fiancé. That meant the debt was, of course, cleared, and our factory was absorbed. I began modifying the techniques my dad had protected for mass production. I worked tirelessly every day. Mr. Adams let me work freely as long as I could make a profit. I continued to study my dad's notes, experimenting and learning. I came to realize how delicate and brilliant my dad's techniques were despite how pathetic he had seemed. When I came home, Lisa would be there waiting with dinner. Sometimes we'd share meals with Mr. Adams and his family, enjoying warm conversations. I can't wait for the wedding, Mr. Adams would say with a smile, and Lisa and I would smile back. Are you still up? Lisa would ask in our shared bedroom. It's for both of us, I'd reply, continuing my work. Thank you, she'd whisper. Closing her eyes on my desk, there'd be my work clothes that she had ironed for me. Seeing them always reminded me of my dad and mom. Time flew by, and three years passed quickly. One night, we had a rare family dinner with Mr. Adams present. To Chris's incredible achievements, cheers. In those three years, I proposed a new production line using my dad's techniques that brought significant profits to the company. If things continued as planned, the debt my dad left would be easily surpassed. Now I can trust Lisa to you even more. Isn't it about time for the wedding? Mr. Adams said cheerfully. How wonderful it would be if things could continue like that. However, Everything I had done was leading up to that moment. Mr. Adams, we're not getting married, I said, looking him straight in the eye. Next to me, Lisa had the same look, but her hands were trembling. I felt the same. We had both been lying for the past three years. What I had proposed to her at that first meeting was to lie to Mr. Adams about getting married and delay the marriage during a courtship period. During that time, I would make enough profit to cover the debt and carry on my dad's techniques. Once that was achieved, I planned to tell Mr. Adams everything. It was the only way to achieve my goal and give Lisa the freedom to marry whomever she wanted. In those three years, I honestly hadn't laid a finger on her. We lived together because of his watchful eyes, but our engagement was just an act. Both of us kept a respectful distance. As expected, Mr. Adams was stunned. Instead of the angry outburst I anticipated, he apologized to her. I'm sorry for what I've done, he said. Lisa had never defied her father before. Seeing the determined look on her face, he seemed to reflect on his own behavior. He allowed us not to marry. 
Moreover, he said I could stay at the company or even go independent if I wished. Mr. Adams apologized to her for imposing his ideas on her. I'm truly sorry. From now on, live freely. Seeing her father apologizing, Lisa started crying. Now she could decide her life on her own terms. Afterward, I decided to stay at the company and continue working as I had. Yet I couldn't stay with the Adams family anymore. That was my last night with Lisa. We kept our usual distance. Thank you so much. Lisa thanked me politely, just like the first time we met. That time, her expression was bright and relieved. At first, I thought your proposal was impossible, but you really accomplished everything, she continued. It's thanks to you, Lisa, but it's not all done yet, I said, facing her and closing the distance a bit. She looked surprised and tensed up. I was determined to fulfill my true final goal. Back then, I hadn't seriously thought about that. However, over the three years, that had become my sole desire. Lisa, will you marry me? Over those three years, I had come to realize her beauty and kindness. Her scar didn't matter at all. I was just supported by her inner strength. When she gained the freedom to choose marriage, I would propose to her. That had become my true goal. She stared at me wide-eyed. Of course, she had the right and the courage to refuse. Nevertheless, I wanted her to choose now that she was free. If marrying me is really what you want, I'd be happy, I said. When I said that, she nodded. That time, she closed the distance between us a bit. Seeing her tears, my eyes filled up as well. As the unstoppable tears flowed, I remembered my dad with nothing but gratitude. A year later, we got married. I still remember the shocked look on Mr. Adams' face when we told him about our marriage. I still continue working for him now. My dad's techniques are at the forefront of the industry. He's probably smiling shyly in the afterlife. Are you still up? Lisa whispered next to me. I still want to work. I started to say then added, Well, let's go to bed, and took her hand. I never thought I'd have a family. Maybe this is the version of me my dad always wanted to see.